So I'm so excited today to be talking to Dr. Stephen Porges, who is a hero I know for many of us in the STAR community um, and the pioneer of polyvagal theory um, and also a wonderful communicator and a very generous spirit. And um, Dr. Porges has agreed to just talk to us today about some really concrete ideas that we can use while we're at the, in the stay at home, stuck at home period with our families to help co-regulate each other. Um, so we were going to just give one or two really concrete ideas around this idea of regulation and co-regulation. Is there a really simple way that you would explain what that means? Well, I would actually uh, go back and deal with what we're, the actual crisis that we're dealing with now and talk a few moments mm. about that and why people feel so uncomfortable or dysregulated during this situation. The first point is that we're in a period of time where things are unpredictable. And this notion of unpredictability is really uh, devastating to how our nervous system works. Our nervous system likes predictability as a metaphor for its own safety. So it's a system that looks for expectancy. And when we violate that expectancy, which is happening now, we get kind of upset. Our body goes into uh, a hypervigilance of defense mode, and that would be the best part of it. The worst part is that it withdraws, dissociates, and shuts down. Because if we're not getting cues of safety, our body adaptively reacts. So we're in this world in which there is a violation of our desire for a expectancy of safety, but we're also in a world in which our normal ways of co-regulating are being violated by the mandates to stay healthy. So we're being told to stay healthy by being isolated. But our body says we get healthy by co-regulating with others. So we're in a basically an argument with our bodily feelings, our neural expectancy to be hugged, to co-regulate with another, with a mandate saying that if you touch people, they may be infected. And if they're infected, you may be infected. And we need to understand that this is a uh, two different aspects of our body's needs. One is survival, which is to really prioritize the vulnerability and the importance of getting infected by COVID-19. But the other one is to be extraordinarily respectful of what our nervous system craves and to be able to give your nervous system those uh, functions or those needs or the, that nourishment through appropriate channels. So at this moment, let's talk about if you're in a family and you're uh, self-contained or self-quarantined, there's nothing wrong with giving people hugs or embracing or, but also understanding that uh, reciprocal behaviors are really how we as a species co-regulate. So it doesn't always have to be, I'm hugging you, but it can be even bits like a little bit of hide and seek, a little bit of peekaboo, a little bit of disruptions of expectancy within safety, within a network of a safe environment becomes humor and game playing. So functionally playing games, whether they're movement games or even board games, are things for our neural exercises for our system. So uh, our body needs this dyadic interaction and we need to create the platforms for that. The second important aspect of this is for many people, as we get older, our portal in this time, in this crisis, our portal for social interaction is through the internet. Mm. And the internet has its limitations, but it is a unusually rich tool during this crisis, something that we've never had. Uh, that's if we talk about deck generations and uh, of time, where we can talk as we are now, and if we are mindful in our interaction, and that means literally if we are doing aspects of what might be called embodied viewing or embodied listening, we pick up each other's cues. As we attend to the cues, we become in a shared space. We literally are sharing the moment together, and that sharing the moment together is co-regulation. But for most of us, we've used video conferencing in the past as something that was casual and trivial. And we never attended to the person's facial expressivity, the intonation of their voice. We were really using it for meetings to get information. Mm. Our bodies don't really give a shit. They don't really care about the information. The information that it really wants is, are you there? 
Are you present in my life? Are you giving me the cues that my body craves? Not that you're telling me things that I should do or shouldn't do, but are you there with me? And so we have to start using uh, the internet and video conferencing as this portal of shared moments. And what this means is that we may merely just sit and stare at each other on video conferencing rather than talking and nod and smile and be engaged. And you brought up some other things that were very important before we started to tape. And that is using karaoke or singing. And we want to understand why that is so important. When we sing, we are extending the duration of our exhalation. We're breathing out. That's how the sounds come. Just like playing an instrument. And when we breathe out, that type of breathing has a calming effect on our body. It downregulates our sympathetic nervous system, which is being recruited during periods of time of threat into a mobilize or fight flight system. It downregulates it and still then uses the sympathetics for feelings of exuberance and joy. So when you do karaoke or you sing, you often feel energized with a smile. Okay. Not just energized with anxiety to get out of the space, but energized with exuberance. So vocalizations, talking, listening, embodied listening, um, singing, these are wonderful exercises. If you have uh, musical instruments, they are great. Uh, I have a strong bias for wind instruments because I was a wind instrument player myself. And I talk about uh, the exhalation when you play musical tones. I was a clarinetist and that it really was a form of yoga or pranayama yoga through breath. And whenever I would give this type of talk, someone would come up to me and they would be a keyboard player or a string player or a percussionist. And they would argue with me and they say, no, it's not just the winds. We all breathe like that when we're in the music. So it's that moment of that shared moment, which includes the breath. And so we have to keep understanding that we have a toolkit that we evolved that enables us to regulate that state. And that could be our breathing methods. That's just, that was so rich and such a wonderful answer. And I think there's some really simple things that we can be encouraging our communities to do. And so the first thing, and I was taking notes, was reciprocal games and playful mm. games like peekaboo, hide and seek. Mm. Um, uh, and I think importantly, really um, playing those games mindfully. So fully yeah. present as we play those games. Um, not not cooking at the same time and keeping one ear on the on, mm -hmm. on what's going on in the kitchen putting our phones aside but really playing together is going to look after our health and well-being during this time of uncertainty I, I think you really hit the most important point and that is being present and doing something mindful is the focusing you're there and we were even talking about that before, that when you're on video conferencing, if right. you're mindful about, the, about being present with the other person, the richness of the interaction changes, it becomes fuller, and you now become a true co-regulator. And when we play, if we're mindful of play, we are role reversing. Just think about the power of that. Role reversing is the healthy nervous system because it's not only uh, monitoring its own feelings, it's detecting the intentionalities of others. Wow. So that's how we role reverse. So this is very important. I love that. And then I think about, you know, how we're going to reset our expectations on these Zoom calls and Skype calls. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking something concrete that I probably need to do is have some different environmental cues that this isn't a work call for me right now. This is a social connection call and it demands my full attention because you're right, I totally do three things at once on a business Zoom call. Yeah. But with a friend or a family member, it requires something very different and a different type of energy. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. And it's one of the reasons I actually enjoy doing these types of things because when I do them, it's all I'm doing at that moment. Yeah. So uh, it actually structures me sufficiently to be totally present because if I'm not totally present, I can't track, I can't anticipate, I can't literally choreograph what I want to say. 
uh, you're also a very comforting person to talk to, but I am finding myself feeling calmer as we have this conversation and it's been a frantic few days. So I can, well, I can resonate with that very much right now. Well, well, thank you. Because what you start seeing is as you start feeling better, I start feeling better because that's the whole idea behind co-regulation. We, we are detecting other people's feelings and intentions. Mm. Uh, outside of our awareness. In my model, I call that neuroception. And it, it takes the responsibility away of saying, oh, I didn't perceive that, I missed that. But as your body is responding, as you become more mindful of your bodily responses, more present, you feel the other person. And this is a true reaction. And we need to be more embodied. That enables us to detect the intentions and the feelings of others. We get really excited about that word at STAR because we think embodiment requires awareness of sensory processing. Well, let me reframe that from my perspective because uh, the, I would say it's respectful of oh. uh, sensory processes. So really? if we start, because we, especially when you're dealing with populations that are hypersensitive, mm. um, if we're hypersensitive and we can't be in crowds or in groups of people, we start to think of ourselves as being disabled or compromised. But if we are respectful of our uniquenesses, we say, how can I navigate through this world? How can I adjust? And that I'm reading my bodily cues and when my body goes into this reaction, let's say I get more mobilized, my sensory systems are going to be now more likely triggered. So, so the physiological state of mobilization or anxiety as many people experience it is gonna change those sensory thresholds. So that if I can calm my body, those same sensory stimuli may not disrupt me as much. That's brilliant, that's brilliant. And then, so thinking about some you know, singing is something I told you I do with my family and we play karaoke. Uh, we sing karaoke as a family and, and actually find a great sense of connection in that. And we're horrible singers, all of us. But <laughs> we have a lot of fun and a lot of enthusiasm. Um, for our, for our young, younger kids or our members of our community who can't engage in activities like that, something very simple like blowing bubbles. Yeah, well, like, think about blowing bubbles because that's exhalation. Yeah. It has expectancy. And you can violate the expectancy by breaking the bubbles. And, and often kids kind of, kind of smile when the bubbles break because you know they're, they're watching them float and then they break. So it's a violation, but the violation is within a confined area. And that's and where humor comes. Okay. So that violation is not disruptive. Yeah. It's got that sort of anticipation of a hide and seek game. Yeah. 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 That's great. That's wonderful. So that you've just given us some really concrete things that we can do to look after ourselves and each other. I liked as well, you mentioned yoga. I think if ever you were gonna do yoga as a family, now would be the time. Yeah, I would also start emphasizing that one of the most powerful to toolkits that we have innately, it's how we breathe. Hmm. And when we, when we move our breath higher into our chest and basically huff and puff, we mobilize our body we basically express uh, the threat that is bothering us. But as we slow our breathing down and we exhale slower, our body calms down. So we have to understand this tight linkage between breathing and our physiological state. And the exciting uh, portal that breathing gives us enables us with an intention to shift our physiology, to calm our bodies down. So as a family doing some breathing exercises, provides this resource and takes uh, gives the child, it gives the family some tool, just in case you start getting a little bit anxious or right. uncertain. Take, uh, the term I use is take your body, move your body into a safe, quiet place, do a little breathing or breathe with a group. So it's being aware that your body is shifting state. That's mm -hmm. through your own embodiment. Acknowledge that when your body shifts state that your threshold to the sensory domains are going to be very different. You're going to be 
overreactive to situations and you're going to be misinterpreted because people will see you much more negatively. Yeah. So the point is that when your body goes into a state of anxiety or mobilization, the facial affect, the way your face shows, is different. And now people don't feel safe with you and you're really uh, basically broadcasting your anxiety into their bodies and you're seeing it reflected at you but being in the physiological state that you're in you see it in reverse you think they're the ones that are the ones creating the anxiety right and then so if we're doing that with our kids i love what you said about do it so we're doing it when when we're okay we're practicing yeah. that kind of intentional yeah. breath yeah. When we're okay and when we're starting to feel like maybe things aren't okay anymore. We're not demanding a return to that state, but mm. we're observing mm. that there's a change. And so we might, might make those kind of statements like, I'm noticing that maybe your body's feeling a bit different. And we're gonna remind our young people, remember when we did that breathing? Let's mm. do that deep breathing again. Yeah, you can do some things also, because when you say, uh, remember when your body felt that way, mm. uh, sometimes people will, the kid will feel evaluated. Oh, good point. And you might be use a distracting model and say, let's, let's blow some bubbles or let's, okay. let's, let's go to a quieter space in the house. Let's reduce the activity around you or let's turn the TV off for a moment mm -hmm. and let's try something else. And you could say, well, the TV and the music is distracting me and I really can't be uh, the supportive mom that I'd like to be. So you could talk about your vulnerabilities mm -hmm. and not, in a sense, blame the child. Because many children with these challenges feel that they're being evaluated all the time. And what we really have to get into our hearts and souls is that most children, regardless of their this, uh, challenges, are good kids. They okay. really want to be... They want to do good stuff. So, and they become very sensitive to the evaluation because the evaluation is criticism to their nervous system, triggers defense. And we want their nervous system to be more welcoming and accessible. And it can't be that way if it's in states of vulnerability and defense. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, you're quite welcome, Virginia. And wishing you the best in this complex period of time. And let's see what we all learn from this and whether the right. world will, will be transformed by our experiences. Right. And there are things that people are already learning. They're learning that the most important thing happens to be their connectedness and relationships with other people. And I think this is a wonderful, uh, wonderful, ex a wonderful uh, product of something that could be viewed as very chaotic and disruptive to the world. There's absolutely that hope that we can hold yeah. on to. I love that. Thank yeah. you so much. Well, you're welcome. Good talking to you, Virginia. Bye-bye.